namely to bestow upon Indra Nui the Stephen R. Covey Pr Principal Center Leader Award. And uh, to help me do that, I'm going to ask Stephen M. R. Covey to come up. Uh, Stephen is the chair of the Covey Leadership Center here at Utah State University. And I will, uh, at, at risk of embarrassing him and also his siblings, tell you that uh, earlier this year, uh, Stephen called me up and he said, Doug, I have an idea. David and I would like to come up and talk to you about it. Would it be okay if we drove up to Logan uh, to talk with you about it? And I said, of course, we'd love to have you come up. And I thought, I wonder what Stephen's going to, uh, what Stephen's idea is. I wonder if perhaps he may know somebody in some place like Tennessee who he thinks might be a good prospect to help us with the Covey Leadership Center. And he's going to come up and invite me to go with him to Tennessee to uh, solicit some support. So David and Stephen arrive, and we have a, a meeting in the boardroom here adjacent to us. And he said, Doug, David and I and all of my siblings, all of our siblings, have been thinking about this. We're so thrilled with what's happening with the Covey Leadership Center and the two professors, Stephen R. Covey Endowed Professors of Leadership, that we want to support. And so all nine of us are going in on this, and he hands me a check across the table for $1 million. <clears throat> I was absolutely breathless. I said, Stephen and David, I said, I said, nobody ever asks if they can come drive 140 miles to meet with me and give me a check. I usually go out and solicit it for several different times. But that's just the degree to which this wonderful Covey clan, I'm going to say, uh, has invested with us, not, not just in terms of their financial support, but in terms of their whole heart and spirit. And uh, I, I like to think that uh, their parents uh, would both be very proud of, of them, and, and I know they are. So with that, Stephen, if I might ask you to come up and serve now as the master of ceremony for this important uh, ceremonial designation. Well, thank you so much, Doug, for that kind introduction. And um, we are so honored to be here today to bestow this special award upon a remarkable leader and person, Indra Nui. And the whole idea behind the Stephen R. Covey Principal Centered Leadership Award is that it's, it represents the kind of leadership that is needed in our world today. We're leaders that can get results and do it in the right way. They get results in a way that inspires trust. They get results in a way that focuses on all stakeholders. They get results in a way that demonstrates a principle-centered core, a humanity, and that, that, that has both character and competence, both. And so it's distinctive in that it doesn't lower the bar around performance. That remains high. It just raises the bar around how we do what we do. And there's no greater representative of this than Indra Nui. And her very mantra and, and philosophy encapsulates it, which is performance with purpose. And so you get the results in the, white, in the right way, in a way that inspires trust, in a way that builds the culture, the people, and that can be replicated again because of what, what's happening. So I would like to have, if we could, um, Indra, so honored to have you here. And if you could come up. And also, could I have the, 
the two uh, Stephen R. Covey endowed leadership professors, uh, Boyd Craig and Lord Michael Hastings, come up as well. Thank you. So on behalf of the Stephen R. Covey Leadership Center at the Huntsman School of Business, and so honored to have David Huntsman here with us today at Utah State University, we are pleased to present and to honor Indra Nui and to present to her the Stephen R. Covey Principal Centered Leadership Award and to give to her the Covey Medal for Principal Centered Leadership. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We are honored to have Indra here, and she's going to uh, share um, some thoughts with us, and then we'll have a, a brief dialogue afterwards. Thank you. Oops. Can you hear me in the back? Or do I need the mic? We're, yeah. we're recording. No, you're recording, OK? So first of all, Stephen Covey, the Covey family, Boyd Craig, Lord Hastings, ladies and gentlemen, it's a privilege to join you today. And I think receiving any award is an honor, but receiving one from the Covey Center, from the Stephen Covey Medal, and from the Huntsman School of Business makes it hell of a, a combination of, of uh, privileges. Um, I've known John Huntsman the ambassador, quite well. I was with him in China. I was with him in Russia. I've been with him at the Annenberg Center, the Carnegie Institute. Um, simply remarkable human being. He's not just a man of industry, but a remarkable citizen, a person, a humanitarian. And I wish we had more John Huntsman in our political system today. So, <laughs> wonderful. And of course, getting the Stephen Covey Medal is a, a privilege of a whole different level. Um, I've, I never had the good fortune to meet Stephen Covey Sr. But there's no doubting Stephen Covey's influence in the world of business because at PepsiCo, we had Stephen Covey people all over the company every time we ran into trouble. Uh, seven Habits of Effective People, bring Stephen Covey in. Speed of Trust, bring Stephen Covey's people in. So anything that went wrong at PepsiCo, we had you guys come and fix it. And it is said that copies of his book, his bestsellers, are found pretty much in every major corporation in the country. And um, reading uh, the excerpts of Stephen M. R. Covey's new book, I think it's going to be a bigger bestseller than your dad's book. So I'm very, very optimistic about what this next generation is going to bring up in terms of furthering business thinking uh, for all of us. So what I'm going to do today is not read a speech. I'm going to chat with you a bit and share with you sort of the seven new skills that are needed to be taught to business leaders. And the reason I'm sharing this with you is because when I stepped down in 2019 as chairman, after having stepped down end of 2018 as CEO, um, it gave me a lot of time to watch events unfold. I had a level of detachment from the day-to-day -day of CEOs. And I watched how the world changed with the pandemic. And I had the opportunity to watch leaders having to face so many issues, which I'll talk about in just a second. And from those behaviors and from the issues, I derived a list of skills that I think new leaders have to be taught because the world is a different place today than even when I became CEO. So let me quickly walk you through these seven skills and then I'll leave it to deans of uh, business schools, to college presidents, to figure out what to do with it. First, 
<laughs> I'm helping you. Raise more money for the school. That's what I tell the universities. Um, the first is foreign policy. You know, there was a great HBR article some time ago which said, does your company have a foreign policy? People thought it was a bit of a joke. It's not a joke anymore. Uh, today, global business leaders, doesn't matter if you're a CEO or just a, running a big business, we have to be skilled in foreign policy. You know, when I was running PepsiCo, we had factories all over the world in 180 global markets. We had to know the laws and the governments and the customs of every region we operated. But today it's different. Geopolitics has become even more fluid. Ten years ago, if you didn't have a China strategy, investors didn't want to talk to us. Today, we have to have a China alternative strategy in ten years. It takes ten years to build a strategy. Now we have to have a China alternative strategy. At some point, Government, our U.S. government was telling us, you better have a Russia strategy. Russia is now an important ally. I remember talking with John Huntsman about our Russia strategy and some of the issues he could help us with. Now, I don't know what we need to do about our Russia strategy. Trade rules are in flux. The old internationalist consensus is dying. And remember Tom Friedman's book about the world is flat? I have no idea what the shape of the world is today. So the, but we do know the world has walls. There's pressure on businesses to shift the locus of work away from certain countries, but we don't know to which countries. And protectionism, isolation, for good reason, I'm not saying it's good or bad, are all creeping in. But businesses cannot spring back and forth so easily. It takes a while to build supply chains. You can't shift supply chains easily. And we were all offshoring to reduce costs, and it was viewed as better for our customers, for our economy, for our national interest. But the pandemic and all these geopolitical struggles playing out today has forced companies to rethink how they should operate, especially if you're multinational companies. So carefully demanding the needs and demands of every country and figuring out how that reacts or that interacts with the needs of the country of your domicile, the headquarters of your domicile, is going to require the skills of a diplomat and learn foreign policy in much more profound ways than we had to in the past. So one of the suggestions I have for universities is, for aspiring leaders, we have a new ball game. And this might be the time when business schools should feel good about being part of a university because start to break down walls between political science and international relations departments and the business school and start to bring some of that thinking into the business schools because it's no longer business is business, international relations is international relations, and politics is politics. They're all blending together. And business leaders today have to be great foreign policy experts too. Second skill, being tech savvy. I mean tech in the broadest way. You know, world the world retreats behind boundaries, but bits and bytes and viruses know no boundaries. They're going to be traveling everywhere. And no matter what industry you work in, just know that the digital world is about five steps ahead of you. I went to a dinner on uh, Tuesday night in, in Manhattan um, with a bunch of Silicon Valley uh, entrepreneurs. I was the oldest person in the room by a factor of two. Okay, I'm telling you, it was humbling. They all spoke a language which I did not understand. Every one of them. They were disrupting every industry as I knew it. And I'm pretty up to date. You know, I sit on the board of MIT, I'm listening to everything. And I didn't understand these kids. They were all multi-millionaires or billionaires. Obviously, they're creating value, speaking a language that we don't understand. But the regulators are people like me. So they were all criticizing the regulators. And I said, hey, hey, let's stop for a moment. When I it was my chance to talk, I said, regulators are sort of minus 10 years my age to my age, you know, that range. If you don't teach us what you're doing in our terms, in our language, shame on you because we're going to regulate the hell out of you. <laughs> okay, cryptocurrency. I said, tell me what is cryptocurrency in English. They don't know how to talk in English. But you know what? They're disrupting us in every which way. So it's, it behooves us to go halfway. 
we have to start becoming hell of a lot more tech savvy or else the world is going to be running at one pace and all of us, quote, business leaders are going to be running at a different pace. I, I was co-chair of Reopen Connecticut. I saw how business leaders who chose to understand the science, chose to become a little tech savvy, were easier to talk to than those who denied the science. Mark can tell you a lot more about it. So if business people today, God help if we have another pandemic or an or a outbreak or whatever it is, if we don't choose to learn the science and become tech savvy, I think we're going to find the world go going to be very difficult and I don't think we, if we can run our companies. And more importantly, how can you adopt, adapt technologies into your company if you don't understand those technologies yourself? So I'm going to suggest that universities try something. Curate courses which talk about these technologies in language that is understandable to business people. And keep sending those modules to your alumni as they graduate from school so you have a lifelong relationship with them. Because people struggle to make sense of all that technology out there and how to adopt and adapt it for their businesses. The third, skill and social issues. Today, CEOs are asked to opine on all kinds of issues me Too, Black Lives Movement, you know, uh, abortion rights in Texas. They don't have some other leader to hang their hat on, so they say CEOs have to opine on it. When I was CEO, I was asked to opine on every issue related to North Carolina because we're a North Carolina domicile company. We didn't want to because whatever you opine on, one third of the employees like it, one third hate it, and one third are quiet, which means two thirds love it or two thirds hate it don't know. I do know that if, we didn't, if I didn't speak up, the one third that don't like anybody speaking up, talk about how great you are. The other one third says you're a useless CEO. So my point is CEOs need some sort of a roadmap, some sort of a way to decide when to lean in and when not to lean in. And maybe even some explanation of what the social issue is. Today, when people talk about woke and cancel culture, I've tried to stop leaders and ask them, what does it mean? Most don't know what it means. All they know is the media has told them it's a bad thing or a good thing. Again, why not the Department of Sociology and the School of Business coming together for some course that says this is how social issues should affect or should not impact companies. I don't know. Look, I'm not... Uh, being prescriptive here, yeah, I'm just suggesting because companies are little, little republics. I always looked at PepsiCo with 150 billion market cap and said, we're the 37th largest country in the world. 37th largest country in the world. CEOs have power. We can take a stand. And jointly, we can move opinions. But we need to understand what we are standing for and what we are taking uh, an opinion on. And... When we do, we have to decide when to do things by the book and when to write a new chapter. Martin Luther King said, social progress never rolls in on the wheels of inevitability. Social progress never rolls in on the wheels of inevitability. And as the lines between business and society blurs, our challenge is not to deny the inevitability, but to accept it and shape it. But we have to be educated a bit more. So maybe a mini course in partnership with the sociology department on a regular basis will help. Skill number four, balance of the short term and the long term. Seems like the most logical thing to do. All that you have to do is study all the companies that have died. You know, the Fortune 500, if you go back to 50 years, a very small percentage still exists. So many have died. Why? I thought companies are supposed to rejuvenate themselves. The most, the, the most common reason why companies do not rejuvenate themselves is an excessive focus on the short term. Now, some of you might say, but that's the role of the CEO on the boards, to judiciously manage the short term and the long term. But then the activists show up if you judiciously manage it and say, give me, give me everything now. I want the maximum returns today, forget tomorrow. And I'll give you an example. I was working on shifting the PepsiCo portfolio to say, our portfolio is heavily focused on fun-for-you products. I want to add better-for-you and good-for-you products because society is changing. 
becoming sedentary. And I think we should offer these products because it's good for the consumer, it's good for the top line and growth. I was told not to be a Mother Teresa. It's not my job to change the portfolio. And if the investor wanted to invest in healthy products, they would buy the shares of a healthy products company. I said, what happens to PepsiCo's growth? You become a cash cow and you slowly die. We've invested in the other company. Let me just tell you something. In the process of slowly dying, what do you think our employees do? The best ones leave. That is not the way to run a company. You have to manage a company for level and duration of returns. It can't always be a focus on level of returns. So you have to judiciously balance it and run the company for the duration of the company, not the duration of the CEO. That's what I did when I was running PepsiCo, and I'll tell you one thing. The first 10 years I was CEO, or the first eight years, I was criticized, vilified in the press. The last four years, I was called prescient. Okay, now if I hadn't lasted 12 years, I'd have left a legacy of what the hell, what the hell did she do? Okay, today everybody says performance with purpose is really the way to run a company. So we have to start teaching business school students this notion of short term versus long term. So that's another skill that needs to be taught. Next one is being a local citizen. We have to be good local citizens in every country in which we operate. A good local citizen. Um, there's no point trying to impose a model that was developed in one country and impose it in another country. It doesn't work. We have to work with the grain of the country that you're in because a good business has to be a welcome part of every society it's part of. It is not a visitor, but it's part of the landscape. That means you have to understand the place. I always said when I got off the plane in Thailand, I became Thai. When I got off the plane in Vietnam, I became Vietnamese because I have to look at every issue through the eyes of the government, through the eyes of the people in that country. When I became CEO, I spent six weeks in China. And the only reason I went and spent six weeks in China is because we were told that was our biggest opportunity, which is true, but I didn't understand the country enough to formulate a breakthrough strategy. And I didn't want to impose our strategy on China because it's a different country with different challenges. In those six weeks in China, visited urban areas, rural areas, went into homes to see how they eat and drink and store products, the size of their refrigerators, what should be the size of our packaging, who does the shopping, uh, you know, how do they buy fresh food versus packaged foods. We did that for six weeks, then came back and said, okay, now I understand China. I still don't understand it enough uh, on an ongoing basis, but for the moment I understood it. And now, if we did this for every country that was of scale and spent less time in smaller countries, perhaps we could devise models that made sense in every country. That's what it takes to run a global business. But for some reason, we do not teach that again in business schools. Many, many good business schools basically have two international trips with their students. But those international trips don't translate to think like a local in that country. So that's, again, a muscle we have to teach. I'm getting to the last two, so patience. The sixth is talent. Good business leaders have to put people first. We teach human resources in our business school, but we don't really teach talent and people development. It takes about 15 years to develop a good CEO. You've got to identify them at the right time in their career, and then systematically nurture and develop them through assignmentology, through uh, relocations, through if it's needed, um, through giving them the right zigzag movement so that they can actually evolve to being a great leader of the company, all the while while the world around you is changing. Yet, we write the rules as we go along. There is no program that at least I know of, and I sit on several business school committees, where we teach talent management in a really important way. But even more important, we haven't yet gotten to a point where we say, hire and recruit for the best talent. Do not be clouded by gender, ethnicity, background, whatever. We still haven't gotten to that point. We tend to hire people who are more like us, thinking that 
Decision making is rapid when you have people just like you in making the decisions. It may be rapid, but it may not be the best decision. So how do we bring the best talent to sit around the room to make the best decisions is something that we have to uh, work on. And I have to tell you guys, if you've had a chance to read my book, I am a product of paid leave. When my father was dying of cancer, I used to work for the Boston Consulting Group then. I was one of the few women in the company. I got a call from the head of uh, BCG saying, we'll be giving you six months paid leave. I didn't know what it was called paid leave. They just told me you got six months with pay. And if they hadn't given me that paid leave, I would have dropped out of the workforce, and I don't know what we would have done as a family because my husband was still in school at that time. My dad died in three months. Three months and one day I went back to work. When I had my first kid, BCG gave me maternity leave, 12 weeks. After six weeks, I started to work from home because I was, I'm just wired differently. But I had the privilege of 12 weeks of maternity leave. And when I had my second child, ABB gave me maternity leave. And when I was in a car accident, I got you know, sick leave because I was incapacitated. I say this to you because nobody wants to abuse paid leave. But without paid leave, I don't know how people are going to have children. I don't know how people are going to take care of sick parents or whatever. And I don't know how people are going to survive if they have a personal crisis themselves. I was just saying, talent, if you have crises, becomes worthless. I don't think so. So I'm just going to say that as we think about talent, we've got to put families, family builders in the center of the discussion. We have to think about the future of work through a whole new lens, the future of work, the future of the workplace, the future of the workforce, and stop talking about families and women in particular as fringe and bring them to the core of the discussion. And paid leave, childcare, all of these become critically important. And teaching these things early on in life is important. Because later on in life, when you try to sort of bring it in, when somebody is a senior executive, they look at it as a distraction, as many business leaders look at today. So I want to end where I began. With the value of universities and schools like this one, I think all of you have a responsibility to educate the next generation. But you also have to shape the future and give young people the early skills they need to evolve and mature and improve as they become senior leaders. So the seventh and the final best skill is teaching them how to bring it all together. Um, you know, a lot more systems thinking, a lot more of integrative thinking. And the one skill I think, you know, they ask you, what's your proposition? My proposition through my entire career has been the fact that I could make the complex simple or connect seemingly unconnected dots to create a shape. It's a teachable skill. And I think we have to start looking at all these things happening in the world today, foreign policy, uh, tech savviness, having social skills, looking at all that and saying, how do they all come together to develop a better leader? I will comment on the case method. Very useful, very powerful. But we teach a case for a week and then go on to the next case. Maybe we should take a case and teach it for a month. Bring the political science department, the sociology department, the law school, bring them all together so we can talk about every facet of the case and really go deep in one or two cases in a business school life as opposed to rushing through every case because we just have to put enough cases on the board to say we've crammed the kids' heads with these lessons. So I, I want to say that creating this picture of bringing all of these things together is to me the seventh skill, the systems thinking. So Stephen, your father wrote that life is not accumulation, it's about contribution. And I think your sister quoted it back to me some time ago. It's a poetic idea and the notion of contributing to something bigger than ourselves and choosing to lead in a time of change and uncertainty, I believe is one of the biggest contributions a young person can today aspire to make. And where better to learn all these skills than in a university, a university like this one. 
And students and faculty here should be very proud and should have an incredible sense of responsibility that you've got the future of the country right here in these halls of learning in universities like this. So I hope you take my comments with that positive uh, spirit. And thank you again for this award and good luck to all of you. I look forward to seeing your contribution. Well, that was magnificent, wasn't it? And um, you can see um, the intelligence and brilliance of, of Indra as a leader. Um, and that's equally matched by who she is as a person in her character, in her humanity. And, and I'm so, so grateful to hear that, Indra. Um, could I, I'm gonna ask just a couple of questions here. Um, I'd love if you could share with uh, um, our guests today what you shared with me. It was almost 10 years ago when I met you in your office and you shared the experience you had when you had just been um, named the CEO of PepsiCo and you went over, you were visiting your family in India and you're with your mother and you're your brand new CEO and all these guests and people came to, to, uh, to, you know, to visit, and uh, you shared this experience, and I thought this is uh, really quite telling, what she learned from this, and then what she did after this. Do you remember what, you know what I'm talking about? Oh, I know what you're talking about. So this was, I think, in 2007. I became CEO in 2006, and my mother was in India at that time, and so I went to see her, and she said to me that I had to get dressed at 7 or 8 in the morning and sort of sit in the living room, and so, you know, you never questioned my mom. So I did that, and you know the doorbell rings and people just start streaming in, people I don't even know. Um, and they'd walk in and look at me and say, congratulations, and then go to my mom and say, you did such a good job raising her. It's your efforts, it's your prayers. You did such a great job. And I, I'm just sitting there watching, I was the prop, you know? <laughs> so I, I just brought people in and that's, that's what happened all morning. And she would just sit there and say, yeah, it's not really me, it's God. You know, typically, just the way she talks. So, which is true, she prays many, many hours a day. So I watched this and I said, you know what was funny? I had never thanked my senior executive's parents for the gift of their child to PepsiCo. So I came back and I wrote letters to all my senior executive's parents. I wrote two or three paragraphs on who I was and why I was writing this letter then a couple of paragraphs very personal to them, you know, what their son or daughter was doing. And they always ended with the final paragraph which said, this letter simply to say thank you to you for the gift of Larry to the company. Uh, it's because of Larry that I'm able to be successful and the company is able to be successful. Over my time in PepsiCo, I think I wrote to 400 executives, parents. And, uh, all my direct reports, not only did I write to the parents, I went and met every one of them in their home countries, Mexico, Italy, Brazil, Spain, I met all of them. Um, and then the most remarkable thing happened. The parents loved the letters. The executives loved it even more because <laughs> their parents were so happy that they got the letter. Um, two, uh, two, uh, two stories, uh, one, um, the head of HR in uh, Asia Pacific, he wrote, me a he wrote me a letter saying his father lives in an apartment building and he made 100 copies of the letter, sat with a chair in the entrance to the apartment building and anybody who came in, he gave them a copy of this letter <laughs> and said, I want you to know what my chairman thinks of, my son's chairman thinks of my son. And the most telling letter I got a year ago from an employee at Frito-Lay who said to me that, he uh, was brought up by a single mother since the time he was six. 
and a single mother now lives in a senior uh, home in Missouri, I think. And he said, it's very, very bare, the, uh, that little house that she lives in. But hanging in the living room walls is only one framed thing. And that's the letter that I wrote her about her son and what he meant to PepsiCo. And uh, Al Carey, somebody talked to me, but you're talking yeah. about Al Carey. Al Carey always said to me, he's the senior executive in PepsiCo. He says, Indra, the problem is in Thanksgiving, I see my mom. She doesn't say, hi, Al. She says, how's Indra? <laughs> <laughs> how's my friend Indra? <laughs> so none of them can go home and say, Indra is terrible because the parents go, uh-uh, she's my friend. <laughs> so it unleashed a different emotion and a bond between uh, the parents and myself. Here's a good part of it. It happened, you know, I wrote about it, and I did an interview with David Rubenstein, and that became a little bit of a well-known thing. Male executives started calling, started calling me and saying, can you send us a draft of the letter you wrote? Because <laughs> we don't know how to write the letter. Because I had a cultural reason to write the letter. They have to find their own introduction, right? It can't be Indra wrote the letter, so I'm now writing it. So they had to find their own reason. So I've been supplying drafts of this letter now to many male executives, and they're writing, CEOs, and they're writing back saying, it is unbelievable, the response from parents. Why didn't I do it earlier? So that's the story, in a nutshell. Isn't that great? <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I've seen some of these quotes by people saying, this is the greatest thing that's ever happened to me, <laughs> to, get, to get this. Um, that's wonderful, Indra. How about the, what you described one time as the, the greatest advice you ever received that you got from your father about intent? What he told you about intent and, and how that impacted you and how you have applied that as a leader? My father was a very humble, simple man, uh, said, assume positive intent. For everything he'd say, assume positive intent. It's the most difficult thing to do, very difficult. But if you take the most difficult situation and assume positive intent, it does two things. One, you actually realize maybe the other person had a positive intent. But worse, uh, better still, it takes the edge off when the person may not have had a completely positive intent, but it doesn't make you think the worst of that person. So it takes the edge off of it. So try it. And I, full disclosure, I got to tell you, my husband reminds me now and then, why do you t t tell people to assume positive intent and you didn't assume positive intent of me <laughs> when I forgot, when I forgot to do something? <laughs> so I, I'm, I will tell you there are times I do forget because I say, you bought this for everybody except for me and I sulk. And he goes, assume positive intent. <laughs> so, you know, I'm, not, I'm human too, but I will tell you, practice that, and you'll be amazed what a difference it makes. Yeah, it's really a remarkable mindset. I try to apply this when I'm driving now. <laughs> Seriously, try it. When you're driving and someone is, you know, is driving slow or fast or what have you, if you assume positive intent and you say, you know what? Maybe they're trying to get to the hospital because they need to take care of something. It just changes how you feel about it. It's a beautiful way of thinking about the world. Um, one more kind of personal one is um, when, when the board of PepsiCo, um, when they were deliberating on who the next CEO would be, um, you and, and uh, a mutual friend of ours, Mike White, were the two candidates for it. And, and Mike did later go on to become the, the CEO of DirecTV, also a great leader. He was the vice chairman of PepsiCo. You were friends. But the, the board chose Indra. They chose you. And in most situations like this, kind of the person that didn't get the job, you know, quickly leaves and goes on and gets a CEO job somewhere else. And, and, um, and but in this case, how... Tell us what you did with Mike, and, and I, I heard this from Mike himself about uh, how you convinced him to stay. And what does that say about you and about him? No, it says a lot about him too, but I have to tell you, Mike was my very close friend. So just because 
the CEO appointment happened shouldn't tear us apart. That friendship was still there. Uh, and so, in fact, when the board was deliberating, we were both watching Jersey Boys and singing along. <laughs> and uh, PepsiCo has this habit of music in our, you asked a question about music. In PepsiCo and all our parties, we had karaoke singing. Uh, but before karaoke, Mike used to play the piano and everybody would sing. That was PepsiCo parties. And so Mike and I were best friends. So when this happened, when I was told that the board was going to vote me in as CEO on Saturday, Steve told me about this on a Monday morning, the first thing I did was to go to uh, Cape Cod where Mike was vacationing. And uh, Mike picked me up at the airport because he'd been told by Steve that Indra is going to be CEO. And um, just Indra was going to be CEO. So I took the plane first to go see Mike. He picked me up from the airport with a card. He had gotten a card right away congratulating me. That's a prince of a man, OK? He met me at the airport. We went to his home. And then he played the piano, and I sang. That's what we did for the next half hour, because we needed to get the tension out of the room. And then we walked on the beach, chatted about everything except the CEO-ship. And then we sat down and said, what are we going to do? I told Mike I needed him. I needed him, and I said, I, I will not make a decision without consulting you. And I want you as my right hand. And I don't want you to rush out of here, because there's no need to. I mean, we both were part of building this company, and I wanted you to stay. Um, and Mike did. He stayed for almost two and a half years after uh, I became CEO. And in every meeting, he was seated to my right. And I never made a decision without consulting Mike. Uh, and we, we remain best friends. And um, uh, you know the big remembrance is that he took me to his favorite ice cream store, which had a long line. But he got permission for us to cut the line, because I had to go <laughs> back. So I have great memories of Mike White. Yeah, wonderful. And, and Mike does Avindra. I've heard Mike tell this story. And, and um, again, this is uncommon. It's, this is an example of what my father called the abundance mentality. And, and, and seeing life through that lens, because typically in a situation like this, it, you, know, you want to distance yourself so that there's clear um, rallying around who the new leader is and not have the, the, the other candidate be right there. Mm. But this other candidate became her right-hand person. It takes a great uh, security to do that, but also truly an abundance mentality. Mm. Thank you. Absolutely. And then how about just this performance with purpose, this whole approach to leadership. I'm thrilled that in the last four years, it became prescient, um, but you were doing it before then, and and um, um, and it really represents the whole idea behind the Principal Centered Leadership Award. I mean, here you are as CEO of one of the largest companies in the world, the 37th largest economy, if it were a country, and and um, and the traditional approach is all performance and the shareholder. And, but a decade after Indra was doing this, the business roundtable redefined what a corporation should be to focus on all stakeholders, but still there's a clamoring for that. It's, it's, it's hard to implement. And yet you were doing this from the beginning. Um, and and um, it became the hallmark of how you approached it. Could you just share maybe, um, the, the, the kind of trade-offs you have to make to do this, but the kind of um, uh, possibilities and the things that happened and the buy-in of stakeholders that you had to gain around this idea that is really a third alternative from the traditional approach of kind of either or. This is an and approach. I actually believe in today's world that's the only way to run the company because we didn't start saying that we want to be purpose-driven because we want to go out and articulate a purpose. That's not where we started. We started saying, what are the big mega trends that are going to impact PepsiCo over the next decade or two? We identified the 10 big mega trends. And then if you future, work future back, it starts to create a very vivid picture of the changes we need to make in the company 
to address these megatrends. One of the biggest megatrends was the trend towards health and wellness. Another big megatrend was the uh, war for talent because people didn't want to come to traditional consumer industries. They wanted to go to tech. They wanted to go to banking. So when you looked at these 10 megatrends and you say, what do we need to do to retool the company? What do we need to do to change the strategy? What investments, what capabilities do we need to build? That's the work we did. And then shared it with the board, and the board said, go ahead and execute the strategy. And I'll talk about it now and what the strategy was. The strategy was simple. We're going to keep delivering performance. We're not going to say, no more performance. We're taking a break for a few years. All that we said was, instead of 10% EPS growth, it's going to be 9% EPS growth. Big deal, but it's going to last forever because we're going to keep reinventing the company. There are those who said, we'd rather it was 12. Cut the investments, give us more. Let's park them on the side. The board said, I buy into the strategy. The strategy was we were going to invest to shift the portfolio of the company to reduce the salt, fat, and sugar in our products, dial up the better for you products, and dial up the good for you products. Every person, every investor we met was already changing their eating and drinking habits. But they didn't want us to change. So the moral code of their life and the moral code of their livelihood was in conflict with each other. And for some reason, they were imposing those conflicts on us as a company. Any country I traveled in, I saw plastic waste everywhere. I got a letter from a bunch of US senators from the coastal states eastern coastal states. They wrote to all the consumer product companies, chiefs, saying, too much plastic is washing up on the shores of the eastern seaboard. We need a fund to clean it up. That's after the fact. We have to prevent it from happening before the fact. There were countries where there was no water. We had a Pepsi plant making Pepsi using two and a half liters of water for a liter of Pepsi. And there's no water in the community to eat or drink or bathe. That's not responsible management. It's just a matter of time before we get shut down. And from a people perspective, if we didn't have the best and brightest, how are we going to remain successful? So purpose was threefold. Human sustainability. How do we nourish consumers with a mix of products from fun for you to good for you? Environmental sustainability. How do we replenish the environment? And talent sustainability. How do we cherish our employees? So it's performance, nourish, replenish, cherish. Which one do you think got the most criticism? The cherish part. It's such a female word, they said. Not that it's a bad program. It's such a female word. Guess what? There was a female running the company. And I'm going to call it cherish. And I am going to cherish you too, even though you think it's a bad word. And all that it meant was, Rather than call you a tool of the trade, I'm going to call you an asset. That's all. I'm going to treat you with great respect. I want you to bring your whole self to work. We're going to be an inclusive environment. And we're going to provide the support structures for you to have a family while coming to work. We had on-site, near-site childcare. We had flexible work hours. We had um, maternity, paternity benefits. What's wrong with those? It's just sensible management to get the best and brightest and be successful. So we future-proofed the company. We had activist investors, two of them. One who apologized to me for coming to the stock because he thought our strategy was spot on. Another who I knew for many years, he still came into the stock, but didn't get an inch from the board who said, we stand behind the CEO and the strategy. Not changing. Hmm. He said, OK, you're too stubborn, and he left the stock. So. There is a way. Um, if performance with purpose is about a new way of making money as opposed to giving away the money we make, it stands a chance of being successful. If it's just giving away the money you make, then it doesn't stand a chance of being successful. And that's where it's a third alternative. And, and because the other, giving it away, won't survive. Make, um, doing this in a new way a third alternative is, is the path forward. Um, Boyd, I have a copy of the book. You've got it right there. So maybe uh, just a, a wrap up question. Thank you. <laughs> um, what, what, what is exciting about having Indra here today is that she just has finished her book. 
Many of you have re read this, but for those that haven't, it's a great one. My life in full. Work, family, and our future. Um, just a couple of questions on this book. Tell me, was it fun writing this? Was, did you enjoy this? What was the process like? And then I really would like if you could just maybe share with this audience what you would hope they would gain in you sharing your, the narrative of your life story. Oh, was it fun writing it? I didn't think it would be so much work. It's a lot of work because um, I'm not a writer. If I was writing this book by myself, just me sitting in a room, it would be a whole bunch of bullet points and dash points, and I'd be done in three months. <laughs> Nobody would read it. So I needed to hire a writer to work with me who would take my voice and put some lyrics and music to what I wanted to say. So I dictated maybe 30 or 40 hours of stories into a machine. We agreed on a structure for the book, and then she would write a chapter, send it to me, and then I would sit and edit it for days, and this went on. Because it had to be in my voice at the end of the day, otherwise it wouldn't be my book. Um, I hired a very good writer, she was excellent, and um, uh, you know, we had more stories than we put in the book, but the book was, we limited the book to 90,000 words. So it had to get done in 90,000 words on a deadline. And the pandemic helped because, you know, everybody mm -hmm. was in lockdown, so we didn't have to travel. We wrote the book. And then the fact-checking begins. That's tougher. Even for my own memoir, there has to be fact-checking. I made the mistake of, or the, I say it in quotes, of hiring the investigative reporter at Bloomberg She'd been there for 22 years. So she wanted to investigate everything. I'll just tell you one little story. There's a story in there I write about going to a training for democracy program in India. And I say, I have no idea why I was picked to go for a 10-day program on training for democracy when I was 15. I mean, what is the connection between me and this program? So she kept asking me, surely there's got to be a reason you got picked. I said, Lisa, I don't know why I got picked. She didn't believe me. So she starts investigating and investigating whether the program still exists, how did I get picked, and how can she put something in the book without a factual background for it. She comes across this little article in the press in India from some library from a guy who went to this program two years later. And he writes, I went to this program on training for democracy in some other town in India. And for the life of me, I don't know why I was picked and how I was picked. <laughs> so she's got that in the file as a fact check for what I said. <laughs> Do you know, fact check took 60 days. Hmm. Fact, everything was fact checked by Lisa. To me, that was more laborious than writing the book. Because you realize that a book is something that's out there in the world. You don't want people to come back and say, you're so full of it. These facts are not accurate. And it was Lisa's reputation as an investigative reporter. So it was quite an adventure for me that my own memoir is getting fact-checked by somebody. <coughs> but that was OK. Um, what do I hope this book will do? This book was written for one thing, uh, to, to use my arc of the, the, the arc of my life to explain that we need to create systems to support young family builders and women in particular. Uh, somehow juggle raising a family and being in the workplace, if they so desire. Support whatever choices they make. And the fact that we don't have the support systems today, not just in the US, in other countries too, support systems don't exist. And so my husband and I basically took a significant portion of our money, including the proceeds of all this book, to put it in a foundation to address this issue. Hmm. So if we can make progress by funding all these organizations that are working on this, to get some movement in this area, that would be success. So that's what we're working on, Steve. Yeah. Fabulous. <laughs> <clears throat> so our last question is this. Um, consistent with uh, my father's approach of Life is about contribution, not accumulation. You being a model of that. And consistent with his last big idea, which is going to come out in a book that my sister, Cynthia, is doing with my 
father posthumously, um, that will come out. The idea behind this book is live life in crescendo. And you love music, you understand crescendo, and it, versus diminuendo, right? The, the point is, your greatest contribution is always in front of you. Live life in crescendo. Here you are, um, CEO of PepsiCo for 12 years, um, having been named by Fortune Magazine the most powerful woman in business multiple times, having been named by Forbes one of the most powerful women in the world, having contributed in so many different ways. And here you are influencing society. As you seek to continue to live life in crescendo, what's next for Indra Nui? What's next? I think bringing this care thing over the, making progress on it. I can't say finish line because I don't know what the finish line is. Just making progress would be huge. Um, if generations of young family builders and young women thank the organizations that we've supported for having helped bring this agenda forward, that would be major progress. Mm. That would be major progress. So I am uh, practical and realistic about what one can achieve in today's political environment, but we're going to try our damnedest to make progress. Beautiful. I love it. Thank you. So thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Indra, for being here. You don't know the Herculean effort she had to take to make it here because of a flight cancellation that happened. And, and it looked like it was going to be physically impossible to make it. And she said, I've made this commitment. This is important to me. We're going to find a way to do this and use literally um, travel brokers to try to find a plane that would get her here. And she did it. We've been honored by her presence. And on behalf of the Stephen R. Covey Leadership Center in the Huntsman School of Business at Utah State University, we have been deeply honored to have you here and to present you, to you the Stephen R. Covey Principal Center Leadership Award. Indra Nui. Thank you.